I'm Tom Rackman, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey. Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Tom Rackman. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. We are now more than 350 episodes in and not slowing down anytime soon. It's because of you, the loyal listeners who tune in each day to Author Stories to hear the best author interviews around, and I just wanted to say thank you. On the right-hand sidebar of the website at hankgarner.com, you can find links where you can subscribe to the show, and it helps other people find the show. The more people subscribe, the higher we go in the rankings, and the easier people find us. Uh, I'd like to thank some sponsors uh, this week for uh, for helping us bring the show to you. I, your humble host, I have a brand new book out. It's called The Pandora Codex. Oliver Weber, book one, A Closely Guarded Secret, A Stolen Artifact, and a Madman Trying to Open a Portal to Hell. Can Oliver Weber become the hero he's meant to be? Pick up the Pandora Codex now. It's the first book in the Oliver Weber series. The second book, Jacob's Ladder, comes out very soon. Go ahead, dig into this series. Grab it now. You won't be disappointed. Uh, My friend Patricia Gilliam has a new series called Series Craft 101, and she has a series uh, of books, uh, the fictional character creator workbook, setting and world building workbook. If you are looking to uh, to put together a long running series like Patricia has done, uh, these are some things that she's learned and that she can help you to get on top of that makes managing a long series uh, much easier. Go check it out. There's a link in the show notes. And we'll be talking about it more. Bokera Brumley has a new book called Imani Earns Her Cape. It's a middle grade novel. You might have heard us talk about it on the show uh, just a week or so ago when Bokera was on. A 12-year-old Imani should be celebrating the most important day of her life by eating merfruit, casting uh, flying spells, and laughing with her mother. But there's just one massive problem. Her mother's been kidnapped by a giant troll, and now Imani is lost in the Fey realm with no way home back to Virginia. Completing her rite of passage alone is inadvisable, but if Imani doesn't want to lose the only family she's ever had, she may have no choice. Transportal train travel, underwater city, submarine, sea dragons, and unexpected family all combine in Imani earns her cape. Thanks for listening to the show. At the end, as always, we have an audiobook clip from my friend Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Hey everybody, it's Josh Hayes, and I'm here with Chuck Manley and Scott Moon. We are Keystroke Medium, and this is the Keystroke Medium Minute. Hey, this is Chuck here with Scott and Josh for your Keystroke Minute, and today we're going to be talking about using voice dictation. Scott, you're kind of the expert on it. What do you think about that? I really want to be the expert on it. You know, it's one of those things. So I, I've been using it a lot lately. I mean, of course, using Dragon Dictation. <clears throat> you can use um, almost anything on your phone nowadays if you do it in shorter bursts. I've also used Google Docs or those so- sorts of things. So a couple of things with Dragon Dictation is there's different ways, reasons to use it. So be clear on what you want out of it. Most people think, I want to use Dictation, and I'm going to write 15,000 words a day and – and, and rule the universe in writing. So there's some problems with that because I did that is all of that voice dictation you do. If you do 10,000 words a day, it all has to be edited and it usually takes more editing than you're used to, especially until you train the program. So that's one thing. Massive production is good for voice dictation. Another way you can use it is for um, writing on the go. There's dragon anywhere um, and some things that allow you to like, you know, <clears throat> Just fit it in wherever you're at. But the reason I use Dragon or use dictation in general is, or the reason I started using it was to think differently. Because it's well known that if you write by hand, write longhand, you have a little bit different interaction with the words in the story. If you type, and I was kind of in a rut, and I used it to force myself to think the story as I talked it rather than typed it. And so that's 
that's something I would recommend trying it for that reason alone. You know, yeah. maybe do it for trial or something. No, I agree. Uh, and I started doing dictation to kind of speed up my production. Uh, but I, I, we talked about this the other day. I can't visualize very well from words to paper uh, because I've been so long sitting in front of a keyboard typing my ideas onto the page that sometimes the image from my brain to my mouth to the microphone to the page gets distorted somehow. So when I started, and a lot of people don't like voice dictation because they're so used to talking or uh, ty typing. So what I do is I kind of do a hybrid where I'll type and I'll get started right. typing and I know where the scene is going. And then say, if I have a line of dicta uh, a line of dialogue, right? So I'll, I'll do a, um, a, a typing section and then I'll say, he, and type he said, and then type the quote and then say the dialogue and then type the, the quote mark and then keep typing. And it does two things. One, it, it forces your dialogue to seem more natural because when you say it, you're going to say it like you are speaking. And a lot of people, when they have problems with dialogue, it's because they are typing words that people don't say. So when you say them, you have to think about how are you saying it and are you saying the correct things. But also the other thing it does is it speeds up, obviously, your words that you're getting down for that day. Because, I mean, you type, what, 80, 50 to 60 to 70 words a minute or whatever you talk in like 250 words a minute. I, I, something ridiculously like that, right? So you can t type and then talk also. And even if you're having trouble just sitting down and, and dictating paragraphs at a time, if you can dictate your dialogue, and even if that's all you're dictating, it will speed up your writing and make your 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 characters sound a lot more natural than just typing all that out. Well, that kind of makes sense if you're actually talking. Uh, I've never yeah. used dictation myself, but I have a lot of older manuscripts and short stories and essays and things that are hard copy only. And I was thinking about taking up the dictation and just reading those into the dictation to get them into a digital format that I could manipulate. So it sounds like nice. overall voice dictation is is useful no matter which way you approach it. I agree. It's a good tool for your toolbox. Okay, well, this has been uh, Josh for Chuck and Scott. Thanks for listening to this Keystroke Minute. You can find more of our show at keystrokemedium.com where we have uh, author interviews and craft discussion and a lot of shenanigans. Uh, come out and hang out with us. Shenanigans. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Tom Rackman on the show with me. He has an amazing new novel out called The Italian Teacher, and uh, this book is, uh, is, is crazy good, Tom. Uh, so thanks for writing it, and thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks so much for your kind words, Hank. Uh, Tom, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, those would be two different memories, and I'll explain why. I wanted to be a storyteller before I wanted to be a writer because I initially thought that I wanted to make films, and I grew up with that longing and that passion for movies. I watched far too many of them. <laughs> when my parents were out of town and they left me money for food, I would go to the local video store back when video stores existed and right. uh, buy myself a big box of cereal and just gorge on movies and, and starve myself otherwise. So <laughs> that was really where I started in, in storytelling. That was, that was where I really started to get bitten by the bug and the excitement, the idea of maybe doing something that for, for others that, uh, that might in a small way equal the the thrill that i got from hearing or rather seeing the, these kinds of tales so that's where it all began and i think that that um it was probably when i was about 12 or 13 or 14 that i that i first thought i wanted to do that in, in film and and it was one of those things where it wasn't a, a single instant but it was that stage of life which lasts probably a decade or more where everybody's saying so what do you want to do when you grow up and and after I, I stopped saying, you know, police officer and uh, and lawyer or whatever silly thing came into my head, I settled on, on movie director. And that's where it stuck until 
things changed in university. And when I went to, I went to college at uh, University of Toronto, and it was a great, really ripe, important time of my life where lots of things changed. And um, I began to feel a little bit disenchanted with, with cinema in some ways. In particular, I, I started to try to make a few films, short films, as I was studying cinema there, but it was really just a history and, and theory program. In my spare time, I, I had this ambition of, of trying, trying out my, my hand with the camera and so forth. But I had a big problem, which was that other people didn't necessarily turn up when they're supposed to. And I realized that, that, it, that it really is a collaborative medium in a rich way, if it works, but in a very bad way uh, when it doesn't. And it's also a very, very expensive medium, one in which I would probably be beholden to producers in one way or another or whoever had the cash. And the possibility of really telling the stories that I wanted to tell seemed uh, awfully difficult and that my best prospect might be laboring away for 10, 15, 20 years before anybody would ever give me the chance to actually uh, direct a film. So I sat down and um, and uh, tried my hand at, at short stories, but quite uh, in parallel to this, uh, literature was becoming my greater love at that stage, that um, quite apart from the practical side of it, I was really engaging with books and stories and words in a way that I never had. I grew up in a very bookish household, but it was my sister who was really the bookworm. And I think that she was older and I wanted to perhaps assert myself as being my own person. And I had different sorts of things that I was drawn to. Um, <clears throat> but suddenly in university, I began to find that whole world opening up to me. And I fell in love with, with reading. And uh, in trying those short stories to see if I could do them, I, I fell in love with that too. The very process of it, the, the disappearing into one's own concentration and one's own imagination and trying to, to come back with something that might interest someone else too. Uh, it was, it was a, a, blissful, uh, um, a blissful period for me. And I remember vividly, I have a, uh, an image of me closing the door in the uh, in the little apartment that I rented with a, another student um, off campus, and <clears throat> I remember closing the door and just feeling that that time too had been closed for the duration of my efforts. That when I stood up some period later, I had no idea how much time had passed. Um, it was probably dark outside at that point, and it had been when I began. Uh, in between, I was somewhere entirely different and. It was um, almost an overwhelming realization that, that this strange thing had happened, that I just had vanished from, from my own existence and had, had uh, entered into somewhere else, into, uh, gone through a door to somewhere quite different. And I suppose that that, that really seduced me. I, I, I've never gotten over that, and I continue to chase that experience uh, whenever I can. Being uh, enamored with film, and getting lost in the characters uh, that is a is a similar experience to getting lost in the writing, uh, but it's a it's a much more immersive experience, isn't it? When the characters that you dream up and the, the situations and the settings just become alive to you. Yeah, I think I think that it um, that if you're if you're say shooting a film. You create a great deal, but you also start off with a great deal of material, not least that you've got human beings who are playing the parts, right? So um, you, you're, already, you're already working with, with a lot of the story told in some ways that, you know, anytime you see a movie with, with who knows, uh, Brad Pitt or whoever it is, then you're not just seeing that character. You're seeing Brad Pitt in physically and all you know about him, and he brings ever, a great deal to that. So he's already told a um, a third of who that character is going to be by the, the the second he stands before the camera, and in literature and writing that is that is completely untrue. That you start with nothing. You start with nothing but but your your thoughts, your experiences, your imagination, and you have to concoct something from that and start from from that zero, which is is can be very intimidating and quite frightening. Even I mean I think that anxiety is a it's a very common feeling when you're starting to write um, because because you, you just feel overwhelmed by it because there's nothing there. If you could fling out a few actors to help you, 
you would do so in a heartbeat. But instead, you have to create all of those actors and their actions and and everything that's going to become of them. And um, that is is frightening, but it's also the thrill when you start to to achieve it, and you can hardly believe that this thing is coming off. That is that is a a great excitement, which I have to make very very clear is not by any means most of the experience of writing. Most of the experience of writing, for me anyway, is is revising and trying to improve and the drudgery of laboring over something that isn't nearly as good as I would I would hope for it to someday be, uh, but that I can see what I would hope for it to be, and that uh, I will try to doggedly labor on until I reach that point, or at least my closest approximation of it. And a great deal of that work is not really that fun. It's, it is, however, needful if you want to produce something that you're going to be proud of. Um, so you, I think that, there, that you alternate these, these um, brief periods of, of, of wondrous, uh, um, almost u- euphoria in the creation with the, the far longer stretches of dedication to the, the craft of it. Yeah, it's, writing is like a quarter magic and three quarters of really hard work. Yeah, I wish it was a quarter in my case. I feel like it's, it's about it's about eight tenths, uh, is the nine tenths is the is the, the drudgery of it, labor of it. But I, I say that, but I do actually I, I get something from all stages, even the the hard, frustrating bits. Uh, I think that that um, initially that those bits can feel uh, they they do pale terribly in comparison with the the blissful side of it. But with time, you also gain a great degree of satisfaction with 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 pulling something into sharper and sharper focus that that you have seen only in in your mind's eye. Yeah, and and there's there's a certain reward uh, that comes with the the hard toiling uh, and the the working and reworking of it, and I, I think that uh, translates to the reader as well. I, I think if it were all easy, uh, then then the works that we do wouldn't resonate so deeply with readers. Yeah, I think so, and I, I think actually that. That the, the big uh, error that a lot of writers make, especially beginning writers, is that they mistake their own bliss for the expected bliss of a reader. And it's almost an inverse proportion uh, that, that the more you labor at things, then the, the better chance you have that it will, it will give some sort of, um, it'll, it'll move somebody else. It's not, it's not an exact correlation, because I think it's also important that you, that you feel some joy in the activity for that to, to communicate, or at least not, if not joy, then some emotional connection with it. You can't just be sitting there uh, as if you're stacking boxes and, and not giving a damn and just working until you get to the end. But it is certainly true that, that the error that many make is not revising enough, not doing enough to get to the, to get it to where they, where it ultimately could be, I think. Right. Uh, you also worked as a journalist along the way, didn't you? How did you get involved in journalism? Well, I got into journalism because I wanted to write fiction. And um, the reason for that kind of backwards approach was that when I finished college, I was 22. I had lived an unexceptional life uh, that was perfectly pleasant, but had not really filled me with such life experiences or understanding of anything that I felt justified in launching into a novel. Certainly the book that I read and admired at that time were so much richer than anything I could conceive of. I felt I, I would have had a great deal of gumption to, to even dare to do to tr- try such a thing. So I set out to try to gain some experiences, and, um, and I figured that the best way to do so while also supporting myself would be journalism, where I could write and travel and see things and talk to people, and uh, so it proved. I, I spent about seven or eight years doing that, and um, and in the process, I always had in the back of my mind this this desire and longing to ultimately uh, write fiction. And I had hoped or wondered if I could do it alongside the journalism, but I just was not able to because to to work you know ten eleven hour days at a computer um, and with words, and then and get home and go back to a computer and again work with words, even if it was a different sort of of words, different sort of writing, it was, it was beyond me. And, um, so I quit my job and I was at that time a correspondent in Rome for the Associated Press. I left and I moved to Paris and I started trying to write and, uh, and through a, a kind of circuitous uh, route, 
I finally ended up writing my first novel, which was published as The Imperfectionist. Nice. Um, other than the, the obvious um, uh, working as a journalist helped you pay the bills and, and survive mm -hmm. uh, during that time, how do you feel like journalism helped you hone your writing that better prepared you to write fiction? It was tremendously valuable to me because it really gave me an opportunity not just to experience those things that I, I mentioned. It didn't just give me a more worldly view of life. It didn't just expose me to many places that I wouldn't have otherwise been, which all of which was, was immensely valuable. It also was a training in the mechanics of words. And I think that, that because uh, we all with a basic education ha can write sentences and can write essays and, and, then there's a sense that from that we should we have the raw material to to make a, to, to to write stories. All we then need is is imagination and some sort of talent. But but it's it's not quite like that. At least it wasn't for me. I realized that in retrospect that I gained a huge amount of technical skill that was useful in the operation of language, in the construction of sentences, the construction of paragraphs and of stories, uh, and ways to engage with readers to draw them in to keep them uh, connected to the story if I possibly could and um, I had thousands of hours working on precisely those skills hours in which I couldn't just get up and say well I just don't feel inspired today because I would lose my job I had to keep working and it was a, certainly a different sort of writing than fiction but the mechanics are, are the same and and in that way it was hugely valuable another another aspect of it that that had great worth to me is the, the reporting side of it that I learned skills that have proved immensely valuable in in my research for fiction that I like to try to make my scenes authentic. So in my new book, The Italian Teacher, it begins in 1950s Rome, and I've lived in Rome, but I've never lived in the 50s. So uh, so I needed to to do a lot of research in that, and that meant interviewing people who amazingly. They were still around from the expat art scene of the 1950s. I, I met a couple and um, interviewed others whose parents had been involved in it. And I did re repertorial work to gather the, the basics that, so that I could, I could tell stories in that, in that world and that they would come alive. And I found that to be uh, so useful, not just in making things feel a bit more real, but also actually in opening up the story, because when you start to understand the reality of living in a particular place at a particular time in a particular sort of status, rank, and particular sort of job, then it, it avails all sorts of details about that particular life that, that may open up story avenues, too, that you might find that um, that so-and-so uh, sort of person had to wear this kind of an outfit, and they had to buy it at this kind of a shop, and that they would encounter these sorts of people there and they had to live in this kind of neighborhood. And you, by investigating all that, you find all sorts of different characters and storylines come to life. So that has been of, of immeasurable use to me too. Uh, Tom, you write a very particular type of fiction. Um, how would you describe the kinds of stories that you write uh, to a new reader? Gosh, that's difficult because I, I suppose that I don't conceptualize them as a particular type. I just write the things that that I like in the way that I like and uh, and try to try to to uh, get as close to that ideal as I can. Um, I suppose that if I if I had to put it into words, I would say that that these are are stories that are that take place around the world that involve people who are flawed, but I hope intriguing in situations that um that are that that i i believe are are powerful and moving and also they give you a glimpse into some sort of different world than 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 that which you know so my first one was a little glimpse of the world of the uh, the the news media and um some of the misconceptions that people have about that uh, trying to write them um but also telling a story in that book the imperfectionists about about particular human beings who might be working in a world of, of considerable significance in our society, in our culture, the, the news, but at the same time were themselves so often governed by small human drives, petty jealousies and, and longings and, and all this, which, which is 
I think so often really what is going on, even in the highest offices of the land. And in this new book, um, I try to do the same thing with the world of the arts and the art world in particular. And give people a peek into what it's like to to be a, an artist, what they get up to all day, why it is that so many of them seem to get up to no good. <laughs> um, the, the new book that you mentioned is The Italian Teacher. Uh, first off, this cover is absolutely gorgeous, and it uh, really grabs you right off the right off of uh, uh, right off the bat, and sets a a certain tone for the book. Um, when did the idea for this book come to you, and uh, did you first, you know, was your first idea to tell a story about the world of the arts, uh, or did a, a certain character come to you first? I'm I'm always really interested in, in where that kernel of the first idea comes from. Well, firstly, I'll say that I completely agree with you. I love the cover that the publishers came up with. It's so gorgeous. And, uh, and uh, I wish that I could claim some sort of um, a role in it, except to, except to uh, except my true role, which was just kind of looking at it um, agape and so impressed and delighted with it. Cause I feel like it's both very arresting but it also captures the 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 mood of the book, uh, that kind of swirling deep colors and all that. So I was really happy with that. Well, um, hopefully you the inspired question, the artist by with your work. I hope so, <laughs> but but I, I don't know. I, I think that they they were they were a very talented. Uh, Absolutely, I know who it was a, a very it was a it was a very very talented designer in her own right. Um, but in any case, uh, to answer your question about where all this came from, I think that you know that that. Um, Speaking of, of having grown up wanting to be in films, and I also had a period where I was a, a, um, a musician. I was I played jazz music, and I was a very very bad musician. But I <laughs> I was a, there was a brief a brief brief period where I thought maybe I would want to be a jazz drummer, and uh, so my point is that I was always really drawn to the arts and really drawn to to attempts to be creative, something or other, and therefore was always hearing about these tales of these these huge stars in the arts who behaved in such unorthodox ways, who seemed to have this power to defy the tastes of the majority and somehow be proven right in the end. And that was an um, extraordinarily seductive idea. Um, and I not only did, did it, was it, did it contribute to drawing me into trying to work in that world, but it also, retained a kind of grip over my imagination. I always wondered what these people are really like. What are the greats truly like? And in the world of writing, I met some of my greats and it was interesting because sometimes they're, they're so unlike what you would expect. And, um, uh, and in other cases they can be impressive or they can be awful and uh, they can be all sorts of different things. Uh, but I began to, um, to get a, a, a inside look at what I had always wondered about from the outside. So it seemed to me that this could make for an interesting novel the idea of offering people a little peek into what I had always been curious about and longed to see into myself uh, now that I had seen a little bit of the the other side so that was a big part of it um, I think another part of it was was uh, personally motivated and that was that um, one of the central questions of the book quite aside from art or I should say quite aside from the art world is the the question of of fatherhood and um, and how or parenthood I should really say and how one can or should act uh, with kids with your kids how how much you should be willing to give up and sacrifice for your children or for your work and this is something that was private and uh, a, a personal concern of mine because I had been so dedicated through my 20s and 30s to trying to somehow gain some traction in a career of writing and I had done so at the cost of many other parts of my life. And the idea of starting a family would have been ludicrous at that point. Um, but as I neared the end of my 30s, I started to be plagued more and more by concern that maybe I was missing out on something really important in my life and that perhaps I wanted to start a family. But I was terribly worried about the potential cost of that because the way that artists, people in artistic uh, careers um, often find themselves behaving and um, and I wanted to really look very closely at the costs and damage of, of of art and wonder ask myself whether it was necessary to 
behave this way and, and to behave in such a self-driven, determined, and ultimately egotistical way. Uh, and if that could be married to the idea of having a family or if it would be a terrible cruelty to inflict that on someone. So I told the story not from the perspective of the artist, but from the perspective of the son of that artist, the son who is most terribly affected by the consequences of that driven man in his midst. And um, and I made myself, in a way, look very, very closely and directly at the worst possible uh, iterations of that kind of artistic drive. And um, and it was a, so in that way, there's a there's an, um, a a hidden level of exploration in the book that was my own. And as as writers, and then hopefully it, it translates to the reader, uh, when we uh, we tend to take things that, that maybe we're wrestling with, like you just uh, uh, talked about, and then amplify that to a, a much more dramatic scale. Uh, was Obviously, this was not something lost on you as you were writing it, as, as this was a personal exploration for you. Um, but uh, in the writing of it, do you feel like um, – did you answer some of those questions for yourself? I very much did. In fact, uh, I started the book childless and I finished the book with a two year old. So <laughs> I, I definitely, definitely answered the question. And I must say very, very happily uh, resolved those questions. I, I knew that in writing this book, I would be thinking a lot about this, but what I did not expect is that it would help me come to a conclusion about what I wanted to do with my, my own life. And, uh, and I, I couldn't be more joyful with the the outcome. Really, I adore my child, and uh, uh, so it 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 uh, funnily enough, it it did help and did answer and did resolve it for me. I love that, um, and, and I love the the kind of dual nature of, of the book of looking at it from uh, from the father's perspective and getting to weigh out uh, the the implications of of pursuing your passion and your art. Uh, but then also uh, dealing with the child living in the shadow of someone else's su- uh, success. Uh, that That is something we don't think about a lot is as we're pursuing our dreams, how is this going to affect the other people around us? Um, are, are you hearing from readers yet uh, about it, how this story is resonating with them? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've heard very encouraging responses so far. I just did, uh, I did um, some promotional travel for the book. I was in uh, meeting with booksellers in the States, and then I was doing some events in Canada as well. So I'm just at that beginning period of, of starting to get more more responses from people. Uh, in some cases, they were just picking up the book at the event, so they didn't uh, they hadn't yet had a chance to read it. But um, but the booksellers had, and some of those, some of the, the keener and quicker uh, readers had actually already read the book when I met them. And the responses were, were very interesting. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was struck by is that, that really almost everybody is, is in some way has some connection to the arts, you know, that, that we, we either are besotted uh, with them, we, we love them and have always consumed them, and or we've, we've, um, we've wanted or dreamed of or wondered what it would be like to be in the arts, and or we, we take part in creating art in our for our own pleasure and our own satisfaction without any professional ambitions for it and so i think that the context is something that that um a lot of people seem to relate to but also also the 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 fact of of this kind of a gigantic big um and rather overbearing character in one's own family is something that that many many people experience and bear is the kind of man who there's one way to be in his life, only one way, and that is if you are helping him in some in some form, if you are a sort of assistant to him, if you are aiding in his glorification and his betterment and so forth. And and for those around him who are so who who love this important man in their lives, they they have a choice. They can either mold themselves to him or they lose him, and that is an extremely painful conflict to find yourself in. But it's one that I think. Many people have experienced, especially when they are in close contact with someone who is driven with by their work, whatever that work may be. Uh, Tom, the book is fantastic. It's called The Italian Teacher. It's on sale everywhere now. Uh, we're going to send everyone to go pick up a copy of it. Uh, if if uh, people are just discovering you and your work right now, where can they follow you online to uh, to keep track of what's going on and to find the latest news? 
Well, I have a, a Facebook authors page, um, which you can you can find by Tom Rackman. You can uh, look that up easily. I also have a website, tomrackman.com, and you can drop me in out there if you are so inclined. I'd be happy to, to say hello. Excellent. Uh, well, Tom, we, uh, we wish you the utmost success with the book, and uh, we're going to send everybody to pick up a copy. Uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much, Hank. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Once and the goal, Hulda said. Land full of witches. Witches in the sky, in the trees, witches down the well. Justine, a great witch. Many herbs, many friends. One day, curse fall. Everyone die, everyone who believe in Hexa. This 1692. Hidden, the knowledge is. The appointed hide it. <laughs> A great curse cast in Salem that year. Legion, she cast curse to kill the day world. In New Amsterdam, they not know, only see. Everyone die. What for? They blame Justine. Chased her off. She come here, I think. Hide from witch hunters. You, her blood. Possibly Hulda was correct. I was a witch, just as she was. She promised my magic would come once I was a woman. I cannot say by what steps I came to believe Hulda's seductive promises of power but I do know the moment when I chose to be a witch, irrevocably and with my whole heart. On the Sunday that Cornelia Van Cortland became Cornelia Beekman, the newly wedded pair made their first public appearance at church, their coming out, as was the custom, so that our poor congregation could thoroughly enjoy the spectacle of her bridal finery. The pair arrived late, with the whole bridal party in wedding array, Cornelia wore fawn-colored silk over a light blue damask petticoat. Gerard wore a waistcoat of the same and a long coat of white broadcloth. After services, the Beekmans graciously shared the leftovers of their wedding feast, serving chicken and ale to the congregation, outside among the graves of the old burying ground. The day was pleasant and the grass sweet. The tenant farmers and peasant wives stood all hunched about, licking their fingers and making little bows of deference. Cornelia held a bouquet of orange blossoms to her cheek, and everyone agreed that she was the most beautiful young lady in all creation, married to the most good-natured and remarkable man. That will be you some day, my mother whispered. The sun kissed Gerard's forehead as he reached into his purse and showered the graveyard with coins. All my neighbors fell to their knees at the couple's feet, scrabbling for pennies. Only I remained unbent. I stood, staring daggers into Cornelia as she accepted a surreptitious kiss from her beautiful husband. Oh, that kiss in the graveyard. A perfect kiss of love and devotion and tribute. She noticed my expression of pain and mistook it for disappointment. Did you not get a penny, dear? She said, smiling. Here you go. She threw her bouquet of orange blossoms to me. I caught it and gave her a tiny bow. Yes, I thought, that would be me some day. I crushed the bouquet to my heart and swore my oath. Cornelia would not win. She was no better than I. I was special, too. I wore no emeralds. I wore no silk. But I trailed fireflies. I deserved such a perfect kiss. I deserved such a perfect man. And if I could not win a god by grace... I would seize one by sorcery.